So in this unit so far, we've looked at a few different ethical theories, a few different views about what makes an action right or wrong. As we saw, Mill, being a utilitarian, argues that it's the consequences that matter, right? Whether or not your action, by and large, is making the world a better place, resulting in happiness, joy, pleasure, well-being, that's what's going to determine whether an action is right or wrong. And Kant, on the flip side, thought that, no, it's not the consequences. It has to do with the kind of will that the person has, the principles from which they're acting, and whether or not they're acting from any personal inclination or desire. Aristotle took a different view on this. He thought that while it's important to know what makes an action right or wrong, perhaps what is more important to know is how can we become the kinds of people that do good things naturally? And he thought famously that the moral life, the happy life, the healthy life we're all one and the same thing. That had to do with self-improvement, working on ourselves, bettering ourselves physically, psychologically, emotionally, all those kinds of things. Well, at the end of this unit, I always like to throw in some ethical issues so that we can discuss them and apply these ethical theories. And for the first time, a class, y'all, voted on this piece to read this piece in defense of sweatshops. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Can anyone tell me what a sweatshop is? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much exactly. Yeah, I think Powell defines it similarly. We could say that a sweatshop is generally, usually like a factory or a workshop where manual workers are usually paid low wages, have to work long hours, and are doing that in poor working conditions. Generally, sweatshops are in developing countries or in other parts of the world. Why? Well, economically, there is a demand for the types of goods that sweatshops often produce. A lot of times, the, those who are working in sweatshops are creating products for the fashion industry or the clothing industry. Generally, we don't have a favorable view of these things, right? Because we think that these working conditions are unsafe or poor, and they usually are. The workers aren't getting paid very much, certainly not making minimum wage according to our standards. And often these people work very long hours. Powell is going to say, though, we have to recognize that our view of sweatshops, whether or not they're morally defensible, well, that comes from a particular perspective and way of life that we are embodying right now. In the West, we do not want to work in sweatshops. We think these things are bad because we have better options, right? We can work in places that generally have better working conditions for more money and for less hours. 
And so according to our own standards, these things do not seem great. <laughs> But not everybody has better alternatives. And that is one of the things that Powell is going to bring up again and again in this article. And so what Powell is going to be doing in this piece is he's going to argue that, well, sweatshops are defensible for three reasons, primarily. One, the alternatives are worse for third world workers where these sweatshops are located. Second, sweatshops help grow a country's wealth and improve that country's standard of living, economically speaking. And third, shutting them down in these developing countries will likely harm people and the standard of living itself there. So at least from an economic perspective, we can defend these things because although they don't meet our standards for good working conditions, fair wages, fair hours, things are not so wonderful in those parts of the world in which these are common and where people make a lot of the goods that Westerners consume. So he's obviously going to agree that sweatshops fall short of the ideal. The question is, for the workers who are employed in such places, would it benefit them or harm them if we tried to shut them down, get rid of them altogether, that kind of stuff? And he brings up a few different examples and pieces of evidence to support this argument. He notes that in 1993, Senator Tom Harkin encouraged banning imports from countries that employed children. Obviously, in the West, we don't think employing children is a great thing. Or if you know a place does employ children, they have to have, be a certain age, right? Or a certain level of maturity, you might say. But this economic argument resulted in Bangladesh sacking 50,000 children employees. And what is the alternative there? Well, for a lot of them, it was prostitution. And so the implication is, look, it's preferable that they have the option to work in these sweatshops rather than prostitute themselves to help keep them and their families alive and eating. Another example case he brings up, 
he talks about uh, this interview with uh, Kathy Lee, who is apparently funding sweatshops in Honduras. Research revealed, an investigation revealed, that those Honduran sweatshops that she was supporting were paying $3.20 per day, whereas normal Honduran workers, the national average, earned less than $2 a day. So even though by our standards it's bad as far as wages go, according to the national average there, they were getting paid much more. And so that raises the question, are they really as morally bad as we think they are? Are they as economically bad as we think they are, if they are better than the alternatives in which you know, the people of these countries are working? He provides two different figures in this article in which he tries to show that sweatshop wages are higher uh, on average than the average income in a bunch of these countries. In the first figure, he notes that sweatshop workers in eight out of the ten countries studied earned more than the national average income, and in half of those countries the workers earned three times the national average. And in figure two, he says that, according to the research done, the sweatshop workers in nine out of the 11 countries studied earned equal or more than the national average income. So on average, those who are working in these sweatshops were faring better, at least economically speaking, than those who are working other jobs, not in sweatshops. Thus, he says, because sweatshops are better than the available alternatives, any reforms aimed at improving the lives of workers in sweatshops must not jeopardize the jobs they already have. And so he tries to explain a little bit why somebody might take these jobs in which there are long hours, usually unsafe working conditions and low wages. Well, he says workers accept these low wages and these working conditions because they are better than the alternatives. For example, prostitution on the streets. And he says, to economically justify increasing wages in these sweatshops, quote, policies must raise worker productivity and or increase alternatives available to workers. Now there is, have been a lot of buzz, especially in the U.S., about the morality and the economic defensibility of these things. And he notes that there have been a lot of anti-sweatshop proposals over the years. People wanting to shut these places down, people wanting to protect American workers and American wages because of if the things that Americans, for example, are consuming are being made in these other countries, well, those companies can justify, according to you know, economic supply and demand, paying lower wages and he says that a lot of the anti-sweatshop proposals that we've seen over the years aren't actually aimed at helping the people in these countries. A lot of them are just aimed at protecting American economic interests. So there's a little disconnect there. And he says that proposals which seek to establish cer certain labor standards will make workers worse off in these places because they would not increase productivity and would decrease the U.S. demand for their products. The implication being, well, if the companies have to institute certain standards, they're not going to be able to pay workers as much. They're not going to be able to pay as many workers. And so these people will be forced to engage in these bad alternatives in order to make a living for themselves and their families. And he argues, that anti-sweatshop laws will make workers worse off by lowering the demand for their labor. This may help U.S. workers in the long run, but it would may put third world laborers out of work, which doesn't seem like a good thing to do. Thus, in conclusion, he says, sweatshops are better than current worker alternatives Sweatshops are part of the process that raise living standards and grow wealth in these countries. 
and more sweatshop jobs will improve people's lives and help their countries develop. So it might be wrong-headed to try to get rid of these things entirely, try to outlaw them, and not give workers in these countries the freedom to accept these kinds of jobs. Ultimately, he says, if we want these people to have better lives, have a better standard of living, allow their countries to go, to grow and compete on the world market, we shouldn't try to shut these things down. We will be hampering these people's progress, these countries' progress in doing that. standard of living SOL that is not shit out of luck okay Okay. I'd like now to just read the very end of the article for you. And then we can have a talk about this, whether or not we think these things are morally defensible, economically defensible, what we think is going on here. On pages five and six, he says, not only are sweatshops better than current worker alternatives, but they are also part of the process of development that ultimately raises living standards. That process took about 150 years in Britain and the United States, but closer to 30 years in the Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. When companies open sweatshops, they bring technology and physical capital with them. Better technology and more capital raise worker productivity. Over time, this raises their wages. As more sweats, sweatshops open, more alternatives are available to workers, raising the amount a firm must bid to hire. The good news for sweatshop workers today is that the world has better technology and more capital than ever before. Development in these countries can happen even faster than it did in the East Asian Tigers. If activists in the United States do not undermine the process of development by eliminating these countries' ability to attract sweatshops, then third world countries that adopt market-friendly institutions will grow rapidly, and sweatshop pay and working conditions will improve even faster than they did in the US or East Asia. Meanwhile, what the third world so badly needs is more sweatshop jobs, not fewer. So. That is an interesting conclusion, something that does not often seem intuitive to us. What do you think about this argument? Do you think he's right? Does it make you uncomfortable? Do you think he's wrong? What are y'all thinking? I know y'all have 
opinions about this, right? Even if you haven't thought a lot about it before. Yeah. I think he's probably right. Um, I just think it's one of those uncomfortable truths that we don't want to recognize that something can be objectively to us bad, but better than the alternative. Okay. Okay, so you agree that in a lot of these places, these jobs would be better than the alternative? I would think it'd be better than children turning to prostitution, but... Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, like, if what he's saying is correct, like, if the facts he's presenting say, oh, yes, this is above the national average for their pay, this is, you know, if they don't do this, then they only turn to prostitution or other whatever job. Yeah. Um, if those are true, like, a, and only if those are true, then, yeah, I, I would say he's right. And I don't know if it's necessarily, I think, I think the United States tends to be kind of like the uh, police of the world. Where yeah. Where they try to go in and say, this is reprehensible, we need to fix this, when I don't think the United States should be sticking its hands and noses in places that are all over the world. And so in this case, I don't think we should have gone to those countries in the first place and say, hey, you can make our product for two cents, where in the United States it costs five dollars. I don't think we maybe should have gone over there in the first place, um, because I think it introduced another level of oppression and exploitation mm. but now that it's over there and these sweatshops that we don't necessarily control ourselves the conditions and the pay but now that they're over there and that we utilize those and it does benefit them more than the alternative for them I don't think we should pull out but I don't think that it should really I don't think we should go because like the alternative would be if we really want to help them, we get rid of sweatshops because we think sweatshops are objectively bad. They don't pay them enough. They treat them terribly. They work long hours. They employ children. If we think those are objectively bad truths, but we still want to help them, then that would include even more U.S. interference by putting in, yeah. like going in and saying, you know what? Your government needs to make laws that, that uh, you know, raise the wages and blah, blah, blah. Is that really our place to be going in there and saying, hey, you need to change this? It's not... Not, I don't want to say it's not our business because, of course, I want everyone to live happy and free lives. Sure. But it's not our business. Um, I think now we shouldn't have gotten involved in the first place due to those uh, lack of protective laws for their citizens in those countries. I don't think we should have gotten involved in the first place due to that. But now that they're there, if we pull out... Like things are going to get worse for them? Yeah. It leaves them shit out of luck and then... If we really want to help them, we're just kind of hampering things that we need to change in the United States anyway. Like, are we going to go over there and then supply companies that are run by the U.S. that will pay them more, will treat them better? When in the U.S. we already have our own companies that treat our own workers terribly, don't pay them enough. Yeah. On top of that, we have our own issues with quality of living and, and I mean, like, we have homeless people that we don't house or feed. We have veterans that end up homeless or killing themselves, things like that where I don't think necessarily that we should put the West over the East in terms of importance or protection. But I don't think at the point the U.S. is at that it's our business to interfere when we have our own problems to work on. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I, um, I wonder also, yeah. I mean, the, so this word exploitation gets thrown around a lot, right? We all have an idea about who's being exploited and how and how much. Do we want to say that these people are being exploited if they voluntarily accept these jobs? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, even if you volunteer for something, it's like... That's like if someone said, hey, do you want to get shot or stabbed? And I'm like, I'd rather get stabbed. <laughs> yeah, that's me volunteering to get stabbed, but that doesn't mean that I'm not getting stabbed. Sure. If I volunteered for it doesn't make it any worse that someone is stabbing me. Mm -hmm. So I would say that these sweatshops are the knife as opposed to the prostitution, which is a gun. Okay. Okay, so you would say they're still being exploited. Yeah, it might just be less. 
Okay. Less than the alternative, but they'll still be exploited. Okay, and that's bad. Presumably, right? We don't want people to be exploited. Yeah, I feel like somebody else had their hand up over here. No? Well, you can see from the economic argument that this seems defensible, right? If it is going to allow their countries to develop faster, if it is going to raise their standard of living, I mean, there's an economic argument to be made there, he thinks, that sweatshops aren't things that we should try to get rid of because we're going to hamper these people's progress in making their lives better for themselves and their families. Morally, though, would you say that sweatshops are defensible? We could apply any one of the ethical theories that we've looked at so far. You might be able to construct a utilitarian argument that says, yeah, these things are defensible because they're producing more happiness than the alternative would produce, or less suffering than the alternatives would produce. Yeah. Is there any, like, any research done about like the conditions of the environment, like the work environment, as in like their government has absolutely no like control over like making those environments better? I I'm sure there are pieces about that. Like I feel like. My problem with it is, is like, yeah, you might be getting paid over your national wage, but you're settling for way shittier conditions than the people making a little bit less than you. So, is it really better or not? Yeah. So like, he kind of talks about this in the article. He talks about how. When people decide in these countries whether or not to take these jobs, they weigh all of the factors about, are they receiving any benefits? How bad or unsafe are the conditions really? Uh, how much are they going to be paid? All of that stuff. And he says that you know, some people are willing to get paid less to work in a safer environment. Um, but the problem with establishing some kind of standard for safety and safe working conditions is he's like, well, that money is going to have to come from somewhere in the economic system. And so if these companies, you know, make these places safer, where are they going to, you know, where is the cost of that going to be laid? It's going to depreciate the wages of the workers. I also feel like it depends on the country we're talking about, too, because... Yeah. I feel like there are countries that have sweatshops that could make the environment better. Like, they invest all their money in, like, their military. Yeah, and yeah. And then it's like, well, you do have that money. It's just you're not putting it towards these shops because why would they? Like, it, it's making them more money as a government to put these people in terrible conditions and benefit off of that like um, whatever, like the product, like they're, they're basically doing nothing to make money, if that makes sense, like the government. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, you could make a similar argument about the U.S., right? Yeah. Like in a bunch of different, uh, what would you call them, sectors, we could improve working conditions for people. We could improve wages instead of putting so much into our military budget. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, that, that might also lead you to wonder, okay, setting aside whether or not you know, these are economically good, if you feel like sweatshops are morally indefensible, does that mean that the U.S. should be intervening in these places? That was something that you brought up, right? Should we allow? like workers in these countries to have the freedom to choose these jobs that are bad? What do you think? I mean, I think I agree with that. Okay, so you think maybe uh, 
being the world police isn't such an awesome thing. Yeah, especially when it's like hypocritical right now. Oh, hi, say more about that. How is it hypocritical? Because like, again, like, I feel like there's people working three jobs and then like they still can't afford things. And yeah. I also think it's like what the thing you mentioned about how the girl calculated where she was funding it and she ended up paying for more. I still don't think it's good. Like it's just uncomfortable and it like sucks that like it has to come to that. Mm -hmm. But it's the, also the fact that like a lot of people like don't even like know the realities of what those people are doing and are just trying to jump in. Yeah. And be like, yeah. oh, I know. Like, but they're not putting themselves in those people's shoes or educating themselves. They just kind of like, I don't know, I feel like it's kind of like jumping on the bandwagon. Like, not everybody who does it, but like a lot of people will just kind of hear certain things but like don't educate themselves on the topic. Yeah, and, and I think it's I think it's human nature to focus on the negative and to focus on what you don't have. I mean, just sit and think and compare yourself to one of these sweatshop workers for a second. Think of all of the stuff that you have, all of the opportunities and blessings that you have. You don't have to work under terrible working conditions to feed your family. You get to talk about whether or not reality is a simulation for fun. How many outfits do you have? You know, how many pieces of jewelry do you have? Pieces of technology, phone, laptop, computer, all this stuff. By the world standards, we are all very well off here. Even if you come from a poor or working class background in the US, much better off than these people. And so if you can recognize that, you might say, why not give these people the opportunity to achieve that kind of bare minimum life for themselves? and work these jobs. Even if you think, like, look, it's nowhere near as good as working as a greeter at Walmart or something. Yeah? I think also it's one thing if these people are truly choosing these jobs for themselves um, and it's a whole other thing if they're forced into this labor because, like, are you talking about like slave labor? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Because um, like recently the whole thing with these companies like she is, I don't know if you've heard. Yeah. But like people have been, and it's the internet, so like you do have to take it with a grain of salt, but people have been like receiving packages with like letters on the pads saying like, help me stuff yeah. like that and it's like how much of that do you believe like I don't know but it is scary to think that like those people could be in positions where they're being forced to do this labor and it's not just a choice so I think it boils down to that fact like, oh, I, I agree that that's also something we should be considering yeah um, obviously we don't want to support slave labor we don't think that's cool. We don't think that's just. When it comes to the jobs that, you know, people are not forced into, what do you think we should do about them, if anything? Yeah? Okay. Having said that, and then also, what do we do? Do we take these factories out, and then if they didn't go to college or didn't get a higher level of education, what do we do with what they have now? Because they probably don't have money to like leave that country 
they don't have money to get a higher education. So it's like, and America doesn't do a good job of like, when they help other countries about like rehabilitation. Sure. You know what I mean? So it's like, I think it's like, at this point, with these sweatshops, there's not a lot you can do without making it worse for them. Like, for okay. the people in there. Um, yeah. And then also, I think it's just like, a society thing of like, especially in America, we're so like, used to overconsumption and like, using these sweatshops. So it's like, if our society as like, a whole can like, reduce what we have and like reduce what we say that we need then it's like maybe we could make strides to get sweatshops to be less hated but right now that's like not possible with like the way we overconsume things in America yeah yeah it's you can't just stop. well you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place right because yeah think of all the stuff that people buy off like I don't know Wish or Timu or Sheen um, think of all the stuff that people buy that are produced by these sweatshops. If we in the first world stopped buying all of that stuff, those people would be out of jobs. And their lives would get worse, presumably, right? Because they might have to resort to prostitution or to other terrible alternatives. But at the same time, we recognize that hey, it's not good that we're buying all this crap. We don't need all this crap. Is this making anybody happy? Is this actually filling that hole we have in our souls? And so it's like, okay, the reality of it is we're consuming all of this stuff. And that is supporting those people in some way because the supply means that, or the demand means they have a job. But if we were to completely pull out and completely change things, um, yeah, we we might be making things worse for them. So it's like, what do we do? I guess you personally uh, could stop buying this stuff. You know, stop buying your Nike shoes. Stop buying whatever's on Timu or whatever. Um, even though it's cute, that would not have any significant impact, right, on the demand for these products. You alone, you know, not buying them. Just like somebody who wants to become a vegetarian and reduce factory farming is not going to have any significant impact. But maybe it's the principle that matters and not whether or not you're actually moving the market in the right direction. Yeah, this is a hard problem. Obviously, our world is imperfect. We have these systems and structures set up that, well, are harming people in one sense, but helping people in another sense. So this is very tricky. I don't know what's to be done. From a utilitarian standpoint, we could say that these sweatshops are defensible. You know, buying these goods does make people happy. And it makes the workers happy because they have jobs and they can feed their families. But then maybe it doesn't make the environment happy because it increases our waste. Maybe it keeps us unhappy in the long run because it forces us not to work on ourselves. I don't know. I'm just fishing for reasons here. On a Kantian view, do you think you could defend these things? Are these defensible on a deontological analysis? This one might be a little trickier. Because generally, I think we care about giving people freedom of choice, right? And if people are voluntarily accepting these jobs, you know, should we take that away from them? You might still say they're being exploited anyway, regardless of if it's a voluntary chosen thing, but yeah, I don't know. What were you going to say, though? Um, I feel like I wish there was a way, I'm sure this could happen, but a way to like interview these people and like just kind of get 
Yeah. Like I feel like that would give us a lot of insight on how they actually feel because I feel like we're just approaching it from assumptions that we make coming from a Western view, mm -hmm. which is like not accurate. So if we were to somehow like talk to them about how they feel about it. Yeah, so maybe there needs to be more communication here before we decide what, if anything, we're going to do about it. Maybe the best thing is just to not intervene at all. I don't know. But then again, we do often feel like it is our job to intervene when there are like human rights abuses. And so in the cases of like slave labor, we might say, eh, we should go in and maybe break that up. But I don't know. I don't know how y'all personally feel about this. To get back to the ethical theories that we've looked at, you could defend this on virtue theory grounds. How could you defend it on virtue theory grounds? Well, virtue theory is all about self-improvement. It's all about working on yourself, acting from and towards the cultivation of the virtues. And so you can imagine somebody in a sweatshop who exhibits courage going to their job, realizing they might lose a finger, <laughs> or you know, exhibits generosity in working these long hours and giving all of that money to their family, not keeping any for themselves. Exhibiting friendliness with regards to the relationships with the other workers there, all that kind of stuff. Now, you could also say that these jobs for these people actually make them better and make their lives better. Even though they're hard and even though you know they're unsafe, if they allow them to improve their standard of living and acquire those you know external resources that are necessary for the attainment of eudaimonia, you might say, oh, look, like this is a good thing for them. But I think you're right. We are coming at this question from a particular view, from a particular way of life with certain values, a certain way of seeing the world with all this crap right, that we don't need these kinds of consumptive lives that we lead. So I'm not sure what's to be done. I think he has a good economic argument here. Supposing his dad is right, you know, and all that. It might be the case that he's wrong. And this argument was written I think over 10 years ago, so maybe closer to 20 at this point. So I wonder how the conditions have changed since then, if they've gotten better, yeah, how long people stay in these jobs, that would be an interesting thing to look into. Is there anybody here that disagrees with him? I was expecting a lot more pushback because I like to assign controversial pieces. And none of you here are like, this is terrible, this is awful, we need to get rid of it all. You're wrong, he's wrong. What's bubbling up for you? What are you thinking? Yeah. There's so many different approaches because the government's running these sweatshops are at different economical points. Yeah. Like, yeah. 
I, I, I don't have enough knowledge on how wealthy certain countries are that I would be able to like defend it through that, but I just feel like unfortunately there are countries that are very greedy with their money. I mean, and corrupt and right. yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's just scary to think that maybe there could be people like in slave labor in these countries that really wish that someone would do something about it and they're not because the country or the government is just like corrupt or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's a worry. I think one of the things that Powell is trying to really bring to the fore here is in our attempts to do what we think is right, we need to be very careful because oftentimes we might end up making things worse. So for example, if we're very concerned about these sweatshops, Maybe we start bo boycotting all of these apps and all of these companies. And then over time, they have to, they lose their jobs because the company isn't going to pay them anymore to make the stuff people isn't going to buy. And then, yeah, what? They're on the streets? Is that really helping them? <laughs> yeah, that's a significant worry, right? And so I guess that's why I'm glad that y'all are in this class. Because hopefully, when you see these problems, when, you, when you're made aware of these things, you will think critically about it from all these different perspectives. Right? What would be the consequences of doing this? What would be the consequences of doing that? What does that imply? What might this lead to? Now, I don't have enough you know, knowledge about economics, markets, and geopolitics and international affairs in order to really provide a super informed opinion about this stuff. But my intuition is that oftentimes American intervention has gone badly and made things worse. <laughs> and I worry that in this specific case actually the right thing to do is to not intervene. But I'm not sure. So maybe I could just ask you all. Do you feel bad when you buy something that's made in another country that is almost certainly you know, made by somebody who's getting paid what you think is going to be an unfair wage, working longer hours? Or is that just something that's kind of part of your life? Can't tell me at least one of you doesn't have Amazon Prime, right? Yeah. I think <clears throat> it's in certain conditions. I, I feel bad, but at the same time, most of the things we consume have come from some sort of exploitation or some sort of like, uh, oh, a view of overconsumption versus like, oh, the fact that I can buy this whenever this costs three times the daily wage of the person who made it. Like, I think if we were not morally reprehensible in everything else we consume, then we'd feel worse, but absolutely everything we consume, like absolutely everything is not morally correct, I would say, in its production. Okay. So we're kind of being, I don't know, <laughs> insensitive across the board when it comes to consumption. Yeah, I mean, you got like the people who are like, oh, well, you shouldn't make things out of wool because it hurts the sheep when they're shearing it. But, you know, you're getting it from this worker who gets paid well and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, okay, well, then I'll get stuff made from synthetic material. Oh, well, synthetic material ruins the environment as well as it's overmade and it, you know, the workers that are making the synthetic material don't make enough. Can't use leather even though it's, you know, whatever, because you end up hurting the environment because of the over production of cattle, 
it affects the CO2 in the air or whatever. Sure. It's absolutely everything we consume from one way or another. There's no angle that you can make everyone happy on a moral standpoint. Is it if you consume animal products, is it can you like uh, reuse animal products a lot? Yes. Can you? Is it a uh, finite resource? No, because you can keep re making animals reproduce. But it's morally reprehensible to kill or uh, leave the animals in the conditions that they're in. And then it's like, okay, so not animal products and synthetic products. And synthetic products are also morally reprehensible because it ends up not only hurting the environment but hurting the humans that make it. And it's just, yeah. I, I think we'd care more in the United States if it weren't for the fact that the regular consumer gets attacked from all angles anyway in the sense that it doesn't matter what you consume, someone's going to be mad at you for consuming it. Okay. So, yeah, maybe we become a little uh, hard-hearted about this. Because, yeah, I, I, the famous phrase is what? There's no ethical consumption under capitalism, right? Isn't that what people say? And so what, what's the solution then? What are we supposed to do? Maybe not, like, really buy anything. But then what's going to happen if we don't buy anything? Our country's going to collapse because <laughs> we're not making any money. And people will be out of jobs and then people are going to starve. And Yeah, so it's like we've built ourselves this, this system that is flawed in many different ways. And uh, we need to keep doing these unsavory things in order to keep it running to prevent you know, starvation and death and suffering and all this stuff. Maybe the solution is to just all become hippies and go build our commune in the woods and get off the grid. Although there are laws governing, for example, how much rainwater you can collect. And there's some laws saying that you have to be on the city's grid, so that might not be possible. <laughs> yeah. What are we going to do? I don't know. Just throw our hands up, right? Soothe ourselves with that consumption that we're used to. You know on Friday night I'm going to be watching the new live action Avatar The Last Airbender on Netflix. What, am I, what else am I supposed to do? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, let me just take a poll then. Do you think that, from an economic standpoint, sweatshops are defensible? Raise your hand. OK, how about from a moral standpoint? Are they kind of connected? We've got different answers for that one. In this unit, we've been looking at what makes an action right or wrong. You might say these theories are based on one's axiology. Axiology is theory of value. What has value? What makes something valuable? What should we choose and prioritize? What values should we have? When I was your age, I valued freedom and autonomy a lot, like freedom of choice. Right? People should be allowed to make the kinds of choices that they want to make, even if it ends up hurting them. You could say that in these countries, they are choosing this because it's better than the alternatives, and we should allow them to have that choice, even if it hurts them. What do you think about that claim? Because I think a lot of you would support that in other domains, right? Oh, even if you know smoking weed isn't good for him, I'm not going to steal his weed from him. He should be allowed to smoke it if he wants to. Or even if you know going to the 7-Eleven and grabbing the big gulp 
you know, 70 ounce drink or whatever is bad for him. He should be able to do that. What do you think? I again am going to say this about the United States business. There's not other countries around the world saying, look what's happening to these lower class, impoverished citizens in the United States. What should we do to go help them? What should we do to go make sure their government can't hurt them anymore so that they're not abused? Other countries don't do that. And I don't think it's. So, what, yeah, what does that imply, if anything? I think it implies that the United States thinks it's the parent of the world. <laughs> I mean, what makes us so much better than these other countries that we are going in and saying, we are more morally defensible than you, so we are going to impart what we want and what we think is better than you. I mean, we look at like, oh yeah, you shouldn't employ child workers in sweatshops. Some sweatshop, some countries that have these sweatshops don't have a formal education system. So it makes us think, why, do we, why are we not okay with children working? Is it because we think that they should get an education instead? Well, these other countries don't have formal education systems. They've never looked at it as, oh, we have children to raise them so they can have their own lives. Some countries look at, or some cultures look at children as, we are having you to help support the family. So is it, are we, who are we to say it's morally reprehensible for you to have a child for them whenever they turn a certain age that's okay in your culture to go work to support the family? Just because we are used to sending our children off to education, especially because it's legally required in the United States. But I, again, other countries don't look at us and say, let's go help these impoverished people that are in this country that obviously aren't being taken care of due to their lack of accessibility to health care or food or transportation. Because some of these other countries that we look at as morally reprehensible in certain aspects also have certain aspects that we probably, as citizens of the United States, look at as better than ours, like transportation or yeah. access to food in terms of like, they don't look at food as a thing you have to have a paywall behind. It's like, yeah, everyone should be guaranteed food. But yeah, they might not treat their workers very well. I just don't think it's the United States business what these other countries are doing because I don't think that we are any more morally defensible than they are in a lot of things. We, it's what makes us the parent of the world, what makes them the children that we have to go scold and uh, make them change their ways. Yeah, well, and I mean, it wasn't always that case in the U.S right there there was child labor in the US and before like jobs that we have come to understand them have been a thing you know yeah the children did work in the fields or around the house or whatever it was to help keep the family alive does that mean that you think we should prioritize looking out for Americans first? Or no? Are there some cases in which we should intervene, say, if we know that, let's just say, for example, we knew that a country was going to start uh, murdering its own people for fun, even though there would still be problems in the U.S., right, with veterans not getting their benefits or, you know, not getting support, homeless population. Are there still things that we should intervene on? Maybe sweatshops just doesn't meet that standard. What do you think? Bless you. Should we have not stepped in? I don't think we. Sh I don't think we shouldn't have because we had the power to, and their government wasn't going to do anything to save them. They were the ones killing them. So like, who else? If we didn't step in, who would have? Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. I don't think there are any easy answers here about what we should or shouldn't do. I suppose you could sum up this unit in a similar way, right? S the situations are always more complex and multifaceted than you think. Grayer, maybe, than you think. 
The important thing, I think, is that you just think and reflect about the issues. Don't do anything thoughtlessly, you know? In fact, you could argue, as long as you are thinking and reflecting on this stuff and trying to figure out what to do, you are incapable of doing any evil. Because you're spending all your time trying to figure out what to do. <laughs> it seems like we're all tired here, though. Should we end class early? Does anybody else have anything that they want to say or add? I'd be happy to keep talking, but it seems rather dead. Okay, I'll let you all go early then. I hear you loud and clear. I hope that this, uh, I hope you talk about this issue though with your family and friends and see what they think about it. Maybe it'll help you to come to a more holistic understanding of what should or shouldn't be done in this situation.